got quiet so quickly. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to CAM. Um, I'm honored to introduce tonight's performance by Have Kahraman. Have's exhibition, Acts of Reparation, on display here at CAM is her first large-scale solo museum exhibition. In addition to her exhibition here, she recently opened Reweaving Migrant Inscriptions at Jack Shaman Gallery in New York. Have's prior exhibitions include Audible and Audible at the Jocelyn Museum of Art in Omaha and Sound Wounds at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. She's performed at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City and Duke University in Durham. Her work has been collected by a number of prestigious institutions, including the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, North Carolina Museum of Art, the Rubel Collection, the Bargil Foundation in Sharjah, and Mathaf Arab Museum of Modern Art in Doha. Tonight, Haif Kahraman presents Gendering Memories of Iraq, a transformative performance that reflects on concepts of diaspora, immigration, and community. It will feature five performers from the St. Louis community who will bring to life a script that is at once personal and part of a collective memory. Before we begin, I want to thank Barrett Barrera for their generous support of the exhibition. A huge thanks to Jack Shaman Gallery in New York, Suzanne Vilmetter Projects in Los Angeles, Third Line Gallery in Dubai for supporting the exhibition and the catalog. Tonight's performance is graciously, graciously supported by the Robert Lehman Foundation. If you haven't seen Acts of Reparation uh, yet, Haves exhibition here at CAM, we're keeping the galleries open for your viewing experience after the performance, so feel free to wander over there after tonight's performance. The exhibition is also going to be up until uh, through December 31st, so please come back and, and bring others to come and see the works. In mid-December, you will see that we will be carrying in the exhibition, um, in our shop actually, the exhibition catalog, which is a wonderful publication that I was uh, very honored to work on with Have. And lastly, I just ask that you please silence your cell phones for the performance. Thank you.
let me share with you my memories. Running. I remember running as fast as I could, and at the corner of my eyes, I could see others running. This was one of those moments where time slowed down as if suspended in air. Would this moment ever end? Will I make it to the house? The loud noises blurred the voices and screams to the point where it felt like I was running in a thick fog, but everything was crystal clear. The source of the siren must have been close. I was nine at the time, playing outside in a bazaar before it hit. Some people scattered inside, scrambling to take shelter, and some just started running. The score of this symphony was simple and repetitive, an undulating war for an event that might or might not end our lives. This sonic memory is different from other memories I have. It sits somewhere else in my memory bank. It encapsulates a multiple sensory perceptive that culminates in what I would call my entire experience of the war. It's the sounds of Operation Desert Storm. And as I sat in my studio in LA, it wasn't too long into my research where I was reunited with it again. The Thunderbolt 7000 siren made by Federal Signal Corporation in Illinois and installed all around Iraq. I played this MP3 on my computer speakers in my studio and I was instantly transferred in time. In his book, Martin Daughtry describes an interview with a mother shielding her children from violent sounds of war by holding them tight and pressing her arms against their ears. Her body, her flesh, then acts as a perfect natural microenvironment to protect her children. I wanted to mimic this concept of flesh as defense, so I introduced pyramid acoustic foam in the paintings. These sound absorbers function by scattering the sound waves in several directions, causing them to dissipate. An object that detains sound. I started surgically cutting my linen and pushing the foam through it from the back. As I was penetrating the surface that I so meticulously prepared, it felt as if I was conducting an operation of resistance. These calculated cuts and wounds were enabling the painting to breathe, letting air pulsate through the surface from the back to the front, to the back, and to the front again. Inhaling and exhaling, it was reaching, resisting, defending, and accepting those sonic sounds. They're not just paintings on the wall. They're hybrid shields that absorb sounds and will alter the dynamic space in which they're hung. As I was reading about sound as modality of power, I came across long range acoustic devices or LRAD speakers that emit high decibel warnings and deterrent sounds strong enough to cause physical damage to the body and brain. These are used by the American military in conflict zones abroad, but also in this very state to disperse protesters. They use ultrasound technology to direct sound to a certain space localizing it. So the person operating the device is immune, which puts him in a position of power. In this sense, this device is a sonic weapon. The shape of the LRAD speakers, the curved corners and the indentations between each edge is simulated in cuts on the linen. It's a violent interruption of the surface, placed in areas of flesh as if infecting the substrate of the painting. Yet somehow, through the physics of sound, this object, this painting, can detain and disperse the present soundscape. The figures in these works are choreographed on image taking, taken from the visual langu language translator smart cards, which are pocket-sized pamphlets distributed to troops once they land in Iraq. They contain cartoonish pictograms of war-related scenarios, hostage slash reward, search, smuggling, weapon identification, etc., and are meant to act as visual translator guides between the American troops and the non-English speaking Iraqis. Within the search section, you can see a pictogram of a man being searched, hands up, fall to the ground, 
and undress. I pose my body in these scenes in effort to question them, to understand them and overthrow them, and possibly create an avenue of decolonization. But there is another side to this, a darker side, one that exists within the psyche of a refugee and somebody who has been colonized, somebody haunted by guilt of having fled the war and having left their community behind. Perhaps I needed to pose in these positions to get closer to the lost community and to punish myself for leaving it. I resigned from my Iraqi self to be a Swede and to be an American, all in efforts to survive. You know, when I cut my linen, I almost feel like I'm doing something I'm not supposed to, like I'm breaking the law. When I came, became a refugee in Sweden, I moved to a small town and I was a student who carefully obeyed the law, a goody two-shoes, always having to exceed beyond my peers and to prove myself worthy. After all, I was brown and so not part of their history and seen as inferior. I still have elements of this characteristic of obeying authority at all costs. I think a lot of refugees experience this type of subordination. And when I was so engulfed and consumed by Eurocentric aesthetics, specifically that of the Renaissance, the linen, that substrate, assumed an authority of sorts. There were rules to be followed. And when I started dismantling my substrate, I felt like I was being a lawless subject. I was embarking to work on a torn surface that was an art conservator's nightmare. I had broken the law, now what? In that very submission, I felt a need to repair. So quickly I found another painting. I detached it from its constraining bars and started to cut strips that I then wove into the original surface. The process was palimpsetic in nature, yet you could still see and feel its original layer. It wasn't restored to its original state. It was transformed. The painting, the figure, her body had traces of scars defaced through her skin. And then another material containing another shredded body is interlaced like a weave. A synthesis of transverse bodies, each with their own mnemonic itineraries. The painting, the body in the painting, is the carrier. Wounded and healed and transcended, not forgotten. And so I get a sense of ending as I send my lost paintings to the garment district to be shredded. Nobody at this point has seen the work except myself and the shredder. And when I receive it in fragments, I'm in awe of its beauty. Yards and yards of shredded lost paintings in my studio that are waiting to be reconfigured. Now each strip carries its own history. And when they are woven into a new surface, there is a sense of resolution they found their place embedded into one another. Braiding, sewing, entwining, knitting and inducing, interlaying the strips of linen into her flesh, cutting her skin in perfect lines, and then mending it. The act of weaving becomes an act of mending. Let me share with you my memories. I remember once when my dad was driving in downtown Baghdad and we passed a narrow street that led into a larger square. I was in the front seat of the car and pointed up toward the demolished building and asked him, what happened? There was a foggy air around this once tall building, now half its size, that made me recall the many dust storms that occupied the city every now and then. It is because of the Iran-Iraq war, he said in a low voice as we turned the corner. That was the first time I had seen destruction of that magnitude. I remember clinging to my mother in the basement of my uncle's house in Sulaymaniyah in northern Iraq. 
I remember my relatives curled around candles, waiting for the loud noises outside to stop. Despite my fear, a sense of solidarity prevailed. I was surrounded by my family, and somehow I felt protected as we all sang and played games in the dark. When the noises stopped, I went out to play with my friends in the hopes of collecting the most bullet shells or the biggest bullet shell to impress my peers. Somewhat golden in color and quite beautiful, I remember thinking. Then suddenly the loud siren went off. It was so loud that you had to cover your ears and run. These howling sounds shook me to the very core, yet they were part of my childhood. Now they serve as a memory that both jolts me to the ground and reminds me of my vulnerable past, a past that I cherish because I lost it. I left my life behind, the house my father built, my friends, my school, my toys. The works in Let the Guest Be the Master are generated from a feeling of losing my childhood and the selling of my home in Baghdad. This was difficult for me because I attributed that home to a tangible space, a space that encapsulated memories I did not want to lose. My childhood memories were interrupted because of war. My history was carved into those walls, not only intimately, but also literally. Growing up, I used the four walls of my entire room as my canvas and fill them with characters, narratives, concerns, jokes, and discoveries. When our home sold, a part of me faded. We tried to hold on to it as long as we could, but my father has two daughters, and we couldn't have inherited the house. The laws in Iraq prohibit a female member of the family from inheriting property. So our home would have had to go to the next closest male kin. The house is also located close to the airport, where sectarian violence is high. There had been a few shootings around the location and on the property itself. Of course, there was the matter that we might return, but this was always dismissed by my family and me, partly because of the political situation, but also because of the growing disassociation with our home. Each panel work is based on aerial views of Iraqi homes with courtyards, some still standing, some not. The act of tracing these lines on the panels makes me feel that I'm archiving and preserving a history somehow. Every line I paint corresponds to a tangible structure, a wall, a door, a room that was once inhabited and had a narrative in its own right. It might even still be there, I also sometimes imagine myself as an archaeologist, digging and tracing these lines to research and recover a past and perhaps a connection with it. I then started researching residential structures in the Arab region, which are engineered to segregate the sexes and conceal the private from the public. These houses are also broken into successive hierarchical sections that herald increasing degrees of semi-private and semi-public spaces and intermediary spaces where the boundaries are blurred, such as alleys, stairways, corridors, and screens. I also decided to use courtyard homes, which are built for and toward the inside, overlooking a central open courtyard providing a little patch of private sky that the inhabitants can claim, it, claim as their own. It is also a semi-public space structured to receive male guests, while the female members of the family conceal themselves behind mashrabiya screens, or shanashil in Iraqi dialect, usually located on the second floor surrounding the courtyard. The figures are all extensions of my own body as I photograph myself and use these images to produce the figures. They are repeated over and over again in the work as a form of assertion and affirmation. They are painted transparently on the brown panels, resembling ghosts that are neither here nor there. You see, as an immigrant or refugee, 
I found that the best method to survive is to imitate. And maybe I did it too well, as I sometimes feel like I'm flickering in and out of multiple worlds. And so, in this oscillating state of being and disappearance, she roams the substrate in a spectral dance, shifting between absence and solidity. Body screen is an installation work constructed of shapes taken from a three-dimensional scan of my body. This was done by a somewhat performative act in which a laser scanner rotated along the perimeters of my nude body, producing more than 80 scans. The body was then sectioned, partitioned into the lattice screen, and placed between the two rooms of the gallery. As an observer, you only have access to the works inside the other room by peeking through this screen. In the Arab region, the Mashrabiya, or Shanshul screen, is a curious mix of technology, cultural dictations, and ornamental design. Functionally, the lattice screen is a brilliant, eco-friendly friendly solution to the problems of regulating air and temperature in a structure while providing protections from the sun. It also creates an avenue for women to observe the men and the outside world from the privacy of their own homes. It is a way to see without being seen, creating an ambiguity in the dynamic of voyeurism. The women in this case can watch the men in secrecy, putting them in a quasi position of power as they become spectators. So, unlike the traditional place of the domesticated woman passively observing the outside world, this work confronts the viewer in a direct way and unfeels, unveils the feminine body by affirming her agency and breaking the mastering gaze. Let me share with you my memories. I remember that it was pitch black outside and our car was finally packed. And as we drove away, I could see my grandmother in the back window tossing water from a glass behind the car for good luck, as if that small glass of water would purify our journey through the night. My grandmother's water was a promise of return to the motherland. I never returned. We had hired a smuggler to take us to a faraway land where we would be safe. And I remember that when we reached Stockholm, Arlanda, the airport in Sweden, my mom took my sister and me to the bathroom, ripped our Iraqi passports into small shreds, and flushed them down the toilet. The bits and pieces floated on the surface of the rippled water for a few seconds before sinking in and then disappearing quickly in a whirl. Follow me, she said, as she walked us to the immigration desk. It was about 3.30 in the afternoon, and my sister and I had to wait outside in the playroom while my mother talked to the police. I looked outside through the window, and it was pitch black again. Here I started my new life as a war refugee marked by my black hair and brown skin among the tall blonde kids in my class. This is my identity, and it will always be my identity. I had to learn the tricks of the trade. I was this peculiar creature walking in the desert snow of Sweden, but when they spoke to me, they became assured and comforted because I made it a point to master their tongue. 
at least phonetically, I could cover myself and be in disguise. If you spoke to me on the phone, you would have thought that you had spoken to a native Swede. Yes, I did assimilate, I did adapt, and I did try my best to imitate them. Maybe they would see me as one of them if I acted more like them and forgot my old self. And I did forget for a while. But not much later, I realized that bleaching my skin, my hair, my tongue was not of any help. No matter how hard I tried to erase myself, I would always be the other person who carried her native home on her back. I will always be the refugee. Warak is the Arabic word for playing cards. Warak is a very personal group of works as they are based primarily on matters my family and I have encountered. I wanted to combine the idea of a scattered deck of cards with the experiences of five million displaced Iraqis. Did you know that five million people amounts to 20% of the entire population of Iraq? Five million is a staggering number, and the loss of 20% of Iraq's population has crippled the country as these refugees include doctors, scientists, teachers, the building blocks of a healthy and functioning community. Warak is a game where people take risks, like lottery. Immigrants who leave their homeland are also playing Warak with their lives. My journey west was a hazardous game of chance a deck of cards. And here I was, one of them, in Sweden. And as I looked around me, I saw my father, once a revered linguistics professor at the University of Baghdad, now struggling to find a job because nobody would hire a non-native Swede to teach English in schools. Migrant 11 in the series is about the contortion of the self, that internal dislocation or irreversible split spawned by one's experience of border crossings. This is, in a concrete way, taken from my personal past. I attended the music and ballet school in central Baghdad. Dance, specifically ballet, was one of my dreams when I was growing up. My childhood dream in Baghdad was to become a ballerina. I was even chosen to be one of the four swans in Swan Lake. And in the midst of our comprehensive rehearsals, the war started and my role that I was so proud to have received was given to someone else because I was set to flee Iraq. When I settled in Sweden, I enrolled in ballet classes but decided to leave. My teacher made it clear that black swans were not welcome in Tchaikovsky's Lake. I could do my Arabian saut de chameau, but le saut de biche was not made for the likes of me, i.e. the daughters of Othello the Moor. The figure in Migrant 3 is actively cutting her tongue. She represents the critical loss of language and communication in the host culture as many struggle to learn and reconfigure their tongues to grapple with their basic needs. The idea of a migrant consciousness has followed me throughout my work. When I was pregnant, this yearning to connect with my Iraqi self grew even stronger. I started wanting and needing my daughter to know where her mother was from. She was, after all, going to be born into a Western context where that link to Iraqiness would be broken. And as I was flipping through a children's book at a store a few weeks after finding out that I was pregnant, I remembered Makamat al-Hariri's collection of short stories. These are 13th century illuminated manuscripts made by the Baghdad School of Miniature Painting describing the everyday life of Iraqis at the time. What a perfect way to describe my past life in Iraq to my daughter, I thought. So the makamat served as formal and conceptual frameworks behind ideas of what it means to be an Iraqi today, or more specifically, an Iraqi immigrant and refugee. It also became a way for me to record my own disassociation with my culture and perhaps a yearning to reconnect with it. The paintings developed into personal stories of growing up in Iraq and fleeing to Sweden. 
The collection was titled, How Iraqi Are You? Stemming from a questionnaire test on social media implementing several Iraqiisms in the effort to determine your Iraqiness. The element of language and connecting to the written Arabic word was vital in these works. The maqamat were handwritten narratives and contained many linguistic riddles. Per my effort to draw inspiration from these historical works, I included text in each painting describing the event taking place. The process of writing the text in the works became somewhat performative and part of the work itself since I was actively relearning how to write. I didn't want to copy blindly. I took my time to examine the original text, each letter, the thickness of the stroke, the shape, the angle, but I was determined not to force anything. I wanted it to be as natural as possible. I was relearning how to write my language and read and speak my mother tongue, the tongue that I don't use anymore and have grown to forget, the tongue I regret not having continued to learn. I look at these Arabic letters with estranged eyes now. I was exported, and so was my language. But it is also my fault for not having kept it alive. I was too busy learning the Western tongue and training my eyes to adapt to English letters. I can now see these Arabic letters from the perspective of an American or a Swede, and that terrifies me. It makes me want to reiterate them, paint them, write them, relearn them, and rememorize them perhaps recover them. I am on the search for recapturing my amputated mother tongue. I am searching for my nine-year-old self who spoke and wrote fluent Arabic. My biggest fear is that if I were to return one day, neither my grandmother's water nor the earth it irrigated for good luck would even recognize me.
let me share with you my memories. I remember looking outside my car window and seeing a mirage and thinking how similar this country is to my own. And yet here I was riddled with guilt and frustration about buying my groceries at Target. I was set to move again, but this time farther away, to a country that is at war with my own, to a country that I never thought I'd set foot in, even though I spoke its language and felt somewhat familiar with its culture. You see, growing up in Bara, I attended an international American school, so English and Arabic were equally integrated into my vocabulary. When I fled to Sweden after the first Gulf War, the American media was already ingrained in the culture so it was as if I were being followed from Iraq to Sweden to Italy and now to the United States. But this was different. This time something happened in my identity as a woman. One day I started drawing a figure. I played around with the figure and slowly she started emerging. It was all very natural as if I'd known her for a while, as if she'd always been there but had never surfaced. That day she finally did. She gave me a voice to speak about her. She told me that she was hanged in the name of honor. I didn't understand. What did she mean? Her brother interjected and said she was raped and became pregnant. She has brought shame to our family and my father and I had to restore and protect that honor. But that's not all. She would rather pour kerosene on her body pick up a match that she normally uses for cooking and ignite herself. These are women just like you and me. At the time, I was one of them, but I didn't know that. It was easier to speak about her than to look at my own life. Yes, I was asleep, and deeply so. But they, these figures, these women paved an outlet that my deepest self needed to uncover. I needed a change a violent change. I wanted to shed my skin and toss it in the trash and never look back again in the hopes that a new skin would eventually grow. I wanted to constrain it, to confine it, to restrict it to this rectangle. After all, that's what I was used to. I was a worn body being beat to the ground. That's when I introduced skin into my work. It's rawhide, the cow skinned, dehaired, washed and soaked in lime. It was sent to me neatly folded in a box. Interestingly, this material was once part of a living organism that moved and breathed, yet now is fully detached, dead and fixed, not in flux anymore. Six women extracting a cross-sectional slice of their own bodies encompasses the gallery space. Each woman becomes a manifestation of a crossbreed, hinting at the affinity of dismembered bodies with fragmented geographic locations. It's a crude act, this detaching of a limb. The shape of each slice is derived from the digital three-dimensional scan of my body that was then cross-sectioned into quarter-inch horizontal slices. What is expected to be seen as the inside of the body in each slice, the organs, the bones, the tissues, is in fact exchanged with skin or more specifically rawhide. The inside then transforms into the outside, where the skin, a protective shell that once engulfed a living thing, is now in the forefront. I wanted to reverse these roles and blur boundaries of dichotomous thought, of mind, body, self, other, public, private, and masculine, feminine. There's something very eerie and intriguing about working with skin. I actually had it shipped to me frozen from Texas. There's a lot of preparatory work involved after receiving the skin. I first soak it thoroughly in water, then it is stretched, dyed, and left to dry. It's an interesting process as the skin changes when it dries. It contracts, gets thinner, and changes color. And the level at which it does this depends on the area of the skin. For example, the stomach contracts more because it's more flexible. It makes me think of a photographer in a dark room developing an image that magically appears after the paper is soaked in chemicals. 
Of course, the sense of violence the skin transmits creates an array of hidden narratives that precedes it. The skin is now marked, reduced to a number, static and confined to these very narrow parameters in a rectangular frame. Whom did this skin belong to? Where has it been and why is it inanimate now? I needed to extract my body, to dismantle it and to fragment it. It was the only way to wake myself up. As I stood there, my nude body being photographed by a man operating the scanning device, I felt a loss of agency, a resignation and submission that made me feel somehow domesticated, comfortable and familiar. The results of looking at my body through a computer screen were cathartic. She became a surface to dissect and divide and analyze. She needed to be sectioned and the sections then reconfigured and nested onto another space, an icosahedron, a structure with the highest form of symmetry according to Euclidean geometry. But it's also a three-dimensional structure that Buckminster Fuller projected the world map on. The addition of each one of these horizontal body slices would form a whole. The violent and nonchalant aspect of plain sectioning a body speaks to the similar detachment and separation that occurs in diasporic peoples. But it was also something I needed to do as a woman. The depiction of these cross sections eliminated the social in the body for me and reduced it to mere function, object, and flesh. It erased the embodied sociocultural experiences that I feel are contingent on our perceptions and views of the world. And so I needed to cleanse my body with water and scrub it down. I needed to erase my old body and I needed to restore and rebuild it after waking up. Never will I let myself sleep as my brown skin grows back again. Am I a commodity? Are my paintings and figures a commodity? I pose in the nude and photograph my body to use as outlines for paintings. My figures then are visual transitions of my own body. The figures are to fit the occidental pleasures, white flesh, transparent flesh, posing in compositions directly taken from the Renaissance, conforming to what they think is the ideal, neglecting everything else, colonizing my own body to then be displayed gracefully in my rectangular panels, carnal and visceral palpability. I provide for you in my rectangles. I know you like it. That's why I paint it, to catch your gaze, to activate your gaze. I want you to buy me so you can look at me all day long. I'm your little oriental pussycat. You can pet me if you like. 